Amen. Good morning. It is so good to see all of you in the house of the Lord this morning. Let's stand as we sing Victory in Jesus. say hello to all of you who are watching online and on television. Thank you so much for tuning in today. Real quickly, as we get started, I want to make you aware of a few things. Uh, Number one, I hope that you uh, received one of these booklets as you came in. If not, you can get one of those uh, from one of our greeters or out in the atrium. Uh, There are over 80 different places for you to serve in uh, in that booklet, and it gives you a little description of each one. Uh, Serving is something that is very, very important to us. And of course, in a COVID world, we have not planned out as far. And uh, we do feel like that we're going to be at a good place to where we can go back to year-long sign-ups in the fall. But this is the spring sign-up. One of the things that Jesus said, I was thinking about this. One of the things that Jesus said in Matthew 20, 28, 
He says, your attitude must be like my own. He says, for I, the Messiah, did not come to be served, but to what? But to serve. And that is a part of who we are, and I know that there is a place for you there. So I, please, uh, if you would, pick up that booklet and look through and pray about where God would have you serve this spring. Also, I want to make you aware of our church conference that's coming up. That'll be next Sunday night at 6 p.m. right here in the worship center. Next Sunday night, 6 p.m. Uh, right here. It'll be a very important time for us as a church family. And I want to thank all of you who have been praying and fasting with us, who, who have been taking this season very serious, because it is the serious business of the church as we discern our way forward. I want to make you aware that this Wednesday night, right here in the worship center at 6 p.m., uh, I will be having, uh, we have the pastor's prayer meeting at that time, uh, and we're going to have a special time of prayer for our church. Also, a part of that is I'm, we're going to be doing a Q&A. So if you have not been able to be at one of our many meetings over the last seven months, uh, or you know someone who has not been able to attend, please be there or encourage them to be there at our meeting this Wednesday night at 6 p.m. right here in this room. Uh, that'll be a very important time for us again as we continue to pray and discern our way forward. I also want to say thank you so much for just how faithful you are week in and week out. Our giving is an act of worship. It's not just something we do out of our own benevolent heart, but it's something that we do in honoring God, and you are so faithful in that. You can give online uh, by giving to the number on the screen that you see, or you can also give for those of you in the room and th with the boxes in the back. Uh, as we prepare to continue in worship and now a time of prayer, uh, I do want us to celebrate the life of Miss Louise, who has gone to be with the Lord. So please be lifting her family up. And also, as we pray, whoever else is on your heart and mind right now, lift them up before the Lord. He hears our prayers, and he answers them in mighty and powerful ways. Amen? Amen. Amen. Well, let's pray, and we'll close with the Lord's Prayer. Father, we thank you because you are so good. You have once again brought us back to this place of worship. I think about how many times you've met people here, how many lives you have touched, how many times you've shaped us more and more into the image of Christ. And Lord, as we come today, we simply ask that you would do that again. Lord, in this moment, we do. We rejoice with those who are rejoicing, and there are many things to rejoice about in life, but we also grieve with those who are grieving, and there are many things to grieve in life. So, Lord, I pray that you would bless us this morning with your presence. Lord, would you show us what it is that you would have us do each and every day. Lord, I thank you for the people called Fraser. pray your blessings on them this morning. I thank you for all those who are watching online and on television. And while it is a different experience, I pray your blessing on each and every one of them. And at the end of the morning, we're going to give you all the praise and all the honor and all the glory because you and you alone deserve it. Lord, we love you, and we thank you for loving us. And now we unite our voices, and we pray as the Lord taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Church, would you stand again with me as we sing another one of my favorite hymns, Glory to His Name.
this morning. Now, if you'll remain standing, let us join together in sharing what we believe as we share together in the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. Well, church, well, church, today is Sanctity of Human Life Sunday. It's a day when many across our nation pause to mark the holiness of life itself as a sacred gift of God. From the first moment of the womb to the final breath of life and each moment in between. And so we invite you to direct your attention to the screens for this video. Created for purpose, a unique genetic blueprint from the moment of conception. DNA woven together to determine gender, eye color, hair color, fearfully and wonderfully made, valued beyond measure. Our culture says life is disposable, her rights matter most, it's not really a baby, and it's all one big choice. But God created us in his own image and whispered, I have called you by name, you are mine. In the United States, abortion is legal throughout the entire pregnancy, totally unrestricted. Most recently, abortion has been boxed up in the form of two little pills and a promise to make it all go away. What will you do to make a difference for life? How can you be a voice? Will you help save a life? We are so thankful for mission partners like First Choice Amen. and Life on Wheels who embody the ministry of life Amen. by the wraparound care that they provide to women as well as men with a focus on crisis pregnancies. Now, sometimes that looks like prenatal health care. Sometimes it looks like resources and supports after a child is born. And sometimes it looks like bringing hope and healing to a person who has chosen abortion in the past. It's an approach that says life, every life, is made in the image of God and all can receive the love and grace of Jesus. And so I wonder, church, would you pray this special prayer with me this morning? Let's pray. Creator God, you are the fountain of life and to life you have committed yourself. You put before us the choice between life and death and urged us to choose life. Search our hearts, we pray. For we confess that many times and in many ways, we have turned our feet to the ways of death. Look high, O Lord, and restore righteousness to the supreme courts of our land. And look low, O Lord, and restore love for neighbor into our own hearts and minds. And let us not merely love with words, but with actions, laying down our lives for those in need. Turn us back to the paths of life through through Jesus Christ, our Savior, who has passed through death and became for us the way, the truth, and the life who brings us to the Father. And now, Holy Spirit, breath of life, breathe on us anew and lead us into that new creation where everything that has breath shall praise you, our Lord. And now we pray all of this in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and all of God's people said, amen. Amen. Thank you, church.
was beautiful. I just want to point out the first verse to that song. The lyrics are, Be still, my soul. The Lord is on your side. Bear patiently the cross of grief or pain. Leave to your God to order and provide. In every change, God faithful will remain. Amen. Let's stand one last time and sing, Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing. Today's reading comes from Acts, the fourth chapter, verse 1 through 31, from the New Living Translation. While Peter and John were speaking to the people, they were confronted by the priests, the captain of the temple guard, and some of the Sadducees. These leaders were very disturbed that Peter and John were teaching the people that through Jesus there is a resurrection of the dead. They arrested them, and since it was already evening, they put them in jail until morning, but many of the people who heard the message believed it. So the number of men who believed now totaled about 5,000. The next day, the council of the rulers and elders and teachers of the religious law met in Jerusalem. Annas, the high priest, was there, along with Caiaphas, John, Alexander, and other relatives of the high priest. They brought in the two disciples and demanded... By what power or in whose name have you done this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers and elders of our people, are we being questioned today because we've done a good deed for a crippled man? Do you want to know how he was healed? Let me clearly state all of, to all of you and to all the people of Israel that he was healed by the powerful name of Jesus the Nazarene, the man you crucified, but God, whom God raised from the dead. For Jesus is the one referred to in the scriptures where it says, the stone that you builders rejected has now become the cornerstone. There is, no, there is salvation in no one else. God has given no name under heaven by which we must be saved. The members of the council were amazed when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, for they could see they were ordinary men with no special training in the scriptures. They also recognized them as men who had been with Jesus. But since they could see the man who had been healed standing right there among them, there was nothing the council could say. So they ordered Peter and John out of the council chamber and conferred among themselves. What shall we do with these men, they asked each other. We can't deny that they have performed a miraculous sign, and everybody in Jerusalem knows about it. But to keep them from spreading the propaganda any further, we must warn them not to speak in Jesus' name again. So they called the apostles back in and commanded them never again to speak or teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John replied, Do you think God wants us to obey you rather than him? 
We cannot stop telling about everything we have seen and heard. The council then threatened them further, but they finally let them go because they didn't know how to punish them without starting a riot. For everyone was praising God for his miraculous sign, the healing of a man who had been lame for more than 40 years. As soon as they were freed, Peter and John returned to the other believers and told them what the leading priests and elders had said. When they heard the report, all of the believers lifted their voices together in prayer to God. O sovereign Lord, creator of heaven and earth, the sea, and everything in them, you spoke long ago by the Holy Spirit through our ancestor David, your servant, saying, Why were the nations so angry? Why did they waste their time with futile plans? The kings of the earth prepared for battle. The rulers gathered together against the Lord and against his Messiah. In fact, this has happened here in this very city. For Herod Antipas, Pontius Pilate the governor, the Gentiles, and the people of Israel were all united against Jesus, your holy servant, whom you anointed. But everything they did was determined beforehand according to your will. And now, O Lord, hear their threats and give us, your servants, great boldness in preaching your word. Stretch out your hand with healing power. May miraculous signs and wonders be done through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. After this prayer, the meeting place shook and they were filled with the Holy Spirit. Then they preached the word of God with boldness. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. Should we obey you or should we obey God? What a statement. This is week three in a series we're doing entitled The Acts of the Holy Spirit as we are walking through the first half or part of the book of Acts. And today I want to talk about how the Holy Spirit gives boldness. You know, my grandfather was born 103 years ago. He has since gone to be with the Lord. But I'll never forget one of his famous sermons that he would preach. He would go to 2 Timothy chapter 3. Uh, this text is not in your notes. But he would say, he would remind the congregation that there's coming a day when there are people who will have a form of godliness but deny its power. Deny the power of God. Some translations say they will... There are people, there's coming a day when there will be people who will act religious, but they deny God's power in their life. Whenever we run up against people who act religious, but do not understand or have not experienced the real power of God in their life, it produces uh, what is called a religious spirit or a religious attitude. And we know what a religious spirit and religious attitude looks like. Uh, there are several key markers for that. Uh, number one, a religious spirit or attitude many times is very controlling. They want to control other people and control how other people do things and how other people live out their faith. Sometimes a controlling or religious spirit is critical. If you're just critical of everything that's going on around them and critical of other people, even other religious people, sometimes people with a religious spirit have uncontrolled anger. They just lash out at those around them. Sometimes it's not uncontrolled anger. Sometimes uh, they always play the victim. They're always the one being hurt in some way. Sometimes those with a religious spirit are simply walking around insulting everything they do not like. We know what it's like to encounter that religious spirit, to encounter people who, oh, they have a form of godliness, they act religious, they know all the words, but they have not experienced the power of God. And that power that God brings into our life by the power of the Holy Spirit produces this thing called boldness. We see it mentioned all throughout and displayed all throughout Acts chapter 4. But as we talk about boldness, I want to talk about what boldness is not. Because I think we have a very unhealthy view of boldness sometimes. I want to give you three things that boldness is not. This is not in your notes, but you may want to write them down. Number one, boldness is not being a bully. That is not boldness. You're a bully whenever you think you have either more power, maybe positional power or something like that. 
you think you have more power or more influence over someone else, and so you lash out at them. That's just being a bully. That's not boldness. That's not God's kind of boldness. So, so first of all, being bold does not mean you're a bully. Number two, being bold does not mean being mean. You do not have to be mean in order to be bold. If you see throughout Acts chapter 4, Peter and John, they're not mean, to, even to the people who are persecuting them. Oh, no. But they are bold. So we can be bold without being mean. Number three is that boldness, boldness should never come from a place of fear. So many times in life, we, feel, we fear that we're going to lose something that we have. And because we fear that, we, we, again, we try to get enough energy or courage or whatever it is to stand up, speak up, and shout out. But again, that's not the kind of boldness that we see here in Acts chapter 4. The kind of boldness that we see here, the kind of boldness that God blesses, is when we have God-given convictions about things that have eternal consequences. That statement is very important. When we have God-given convictions, not my desired outcomes, no, not what I want to see. No, when we have God-given convictions about things that have eternal consequences, not just consequences here on this earth, that's the kind of boldness that God blesses. And boldness, if you want a definition of it, boldness is the courage and confidence we have in doing two things, two very important things. First of all, Scripture says we have boldness in approaching God. Approaching God, that's a bold step. He is holy, we are not, right? Yes? So boldness in approaching God. And then we can have boldness in fulfilling God's purposes, eternal purposes, in the presence of others. That's what Peter and John is doing here. Now, whenever I say in the presence of others, being in the presence of others does not imply an enemy in any way. You can be bold with friends, right? But boldness many times implies that there is an enemy. In fact, the one thing that is, uh, or one of the things that's universal with human beings is that at some point in our life, we are going to live in fear of another person. Everybody's going to fear somebody at some point in their life. You know what that feeling is. I know what that feeling is. Everybody's going to fear somebody in life. And yet we have this calling to boldness in the midst of that fear, in the fear of people or a particular person in a particular situation. But Scripture tells us over and over that fearing people, all it does is trap you. All it does is trap you. In fact, Proverbs 29, 25 says, Fearing people is a dangerous trap. That's all it does. It's just going to trap you. Fearing people is a dangerous trap, but trusting the Lord means safety. Trusting the Lord means safety. You see, whenever we walk in fear of other people, number one, we're mentally trapped. And we're mentally trapped because uh, we, we spend our time thinking about the one that we fear. And we, we, we normally don't say it that way. Normally we say something like, they hurt me or, or they did something to me and I just can't get over it. As soon as you say that, you're mentally trapped. And when we're mentally trapped, we're going to be emotionally trapped. You know, whenever we fear someone, most of the time we just try to avoid them, right? We just don't want to have anything to do with them. We try to avoid them. But then in those occasions when we have to be around them, we know that we are emotionally trapped because whenever we see them, all of a sudden either we get uncomfortable or anger or uh, we get upset on the inside and we can feel ourselves fear in their presence. That's when we're emotionally trapped. And when you're mentally trapped and emotionally trapped, it's going to lead to being spiritually trapped. Meaning they are going to occupy our mind instead of our mind being focused on God. Over and over, Scripture says, fearing people, all it does is trap you. That's why the writer of Hebrews said in Hebrews 13, 6, so we can say with confidence, the Lord is my helper. Since the Lord is my helper, what does that mean? So I will have no fear. Fear of who? Look, fear of what mere people can do to me. I'll have no fear of what people can do to me. Now, you may say, Chris, uh, that sounds really good in theory, but people can do a lot of things to me, right? 
People can hate me. They can talk about me. They can try to ruin my reputation. They can triangulate others against me. And the right people in life can fire me. People can do a lot of things to me. You've got to remember, none of that has eternal consequences. None of it. That's why Paul wrote in Romans 8.31, If God is for us, who can ever be against us? Who can ever be against us? It was Jesus who said in John 10, No one can snatch you out of my hand. No one can do that. And again, over and over, Scripture calls us to this place where we do not live in fear of people, but we constantly look to the Lord who is our helper, and where he is, there is safety. And this is where we have to live. Proverbs 18.10 puts it this way. The name of the Lord is a strong fortress. Notice the word fortress. The name of the Lord is a strong fortress. The godly run to him and are safe. Now, a good fortress, what does it do? It protects you from every angle of attack. And so whenever Solomon says, the name of the Lord is a strong fortress, he's saying that no matter what type of attack comes your way, there is safety In the Lord. And this is the attitude, this is the mindset that Peter and John have as they walk into Acts chapter 4. And there are three particular passages that I want to draw out around this theme of boldness and how they teach us to be bold. So let me give you three points. The first one is this the first one is simply that I am bold when I spend time with God. I am bold when I spend time with God. Now, if that sounds familiar from our previous two weeks, then you're starting to see a major theme in the book of Acts. And that is the people of God throughout the book of Acts are spending time with God. You see them gathering in prayer. You see them gathering in worship. Over and over we see this. Look at Acts chapter 4, verse 13. After the accusations have been made, it says the members of the council were amazed when they saw the boldness of Peter and John. Now notice, the members of the council here, the members of the council, this is the powerful people, the influential people. And this is the, these are the people who want to use their power and their influence to bully, to be mean, and to incite fear in Peter and John. But they're taken aback in this moment. They're taken aback because it says they see the boldness of Peter and John. That was the first thing that amazed them. The second thing that amazed them, it says, for they could see that they were ordinary men with no special training in the scriptures, meaning they didn't go to seminary. They did not carry the world's qualifications. And in this moment, standing before these influential, very powerful people, Peter and John, not being a bully, not being mean, not living out of fear, they are bold. Why? Where did they get that boldness from? Notice what it says. They also recognized them as men who had been with Jesus. You see, when you spend time with God... When you spend time with Jesus, when you spend time with the Holy Spirit, it produces a boldness in you that you cannot muster on your own. What a great word, muster. Wasn't that wonderful? Makes me hungry for a hamburger. Anyway. (laughs) The boldness that we get when we spend time with God is boldness that we cannot produce on our own. And when we spend time with God, we become what the Bible calls godly. Godly, you see that word throughout Scripture. The more time we spend with God, the more God rubs off on us, and the more godly we become. I point that out because Proverbs 28 verse 1 says, the wicked run away when no one is chasing them. They just run away when no one is chasing them. When you have a guilty conscience, you fear the potential of fear. You with me there? It says, the wicked run away when no one is chasing them, but the godly are as bold as lions. You know, I prepare my sermons uh, weeks out, and uh, I put an outline together, and I'm researching scriptures and things like that. Several weeks ago, I, I, I put this uh, outline together. I was doing research on some scriptures. The next day, I met with uh, a missionary from Kenya. 
His name is Fred. He's one of our mission partners. He, he runs an organization called Fred's Kids. They do an amazing job with orphans in Kenya. And I just put this verse in my notes the day before, Proverbs 28, verse 1. The godly are as bold as lions. And we're sitting there talking, and he's telling me about everything that's going on over there, all the amazing things that God is doing, how many kids they're impacting, and all that stuff. And before he left, he said, Chris, I have a gift for you. I said, okay. He said, I brought this from Kenya. It's a lion. He says, I brought this to you because the Bible says the godly are as bold as lions. He didn't know I just put that verse in my notes for this Sunday. The godly are as bold as lions, it says. And so what we do is Psalm 138, verse 3. We go to God. We cry out to God. Notice it says, as soon as I pray, you answer me. And you encourage me by giving me strength. Again, boldness is not built on our strength or our courage. We need to be encouraged. We need courage instilled in us. That's why the psalmist says, as soon as I pray, you answer me. What is the answer? You encourage me by giving me your strength. You instill courage in me. And the first bold move that I think that we have to make, the first bold step that we have to take is a step toward God. It is a step toward God. I know so many believers who are scared to death of God. It plays out in our life in so many ways. And so many times we are scared to death that God is going to show up, do something, move in a way that we don't like or we're not comfortable with. Hebrews 10, 19 says, And so, dear brothers and sisters, we can boldly, boldly enter heaven's most holy place. Why? Because of the blood of Jesus. We can boldly enter the presence of God. And you say, well, Chris, I thought that we were, in approaching God, we were to be humble. We were to be reverent. We were to approach God with respect. Of course we are. Boldness is not incompatible with humbleness. Boldness is not incompatible with being reverent or respecting God. No, but we can now approach God because of what Jesus has done in real time and space in human history to make a way for the curtain to be torn so that we can enter God's presence. And the more time we spend with God, the more bold we become around his eternal purposes. You with me? Point number two. Point number two is that I am bold when I desire to fulfill God's purposes. When I want God's purpose for my life above any other thing. I love that verse in Acts 13. In Acts 13, it says that David fulfilled the purposes of God in his own generation. What an amazing statement to make about a human being after their life is over. That you fulfilled the purpose of God for your generation, whatever that may be. You see, there are three fund fundamental questions every Christian has to ask. The first question that we have to ask ourselves is do I really want what God wants? Do I really want what God wants? It's a very important question. When you want what God wants, that means you want God's will for your life. And if you're going to have God's will for your life, you're going to have to learn God's will for your life. It's something you have to learn. It, it, you don't automatically know what it is. But when you really want what God wants, you want God's will, and so you have to learn it over time. That's why Colossians, this is not in your notes and not on the screen, but Colossians 3.10 says, put on your new nature, something we have to do. Put on your new nature and be renewed as you learn to know your creator and become like him. That is walking in his will. So the first question we have to ask ourselves is, do I really want what God wants? The second question I have to ask myself is, am I willing to follow where God leads? Am I really willing to follow where God leads? The word is to lean on him. Proverbs 3, lean not on your own understanding. Do I want to lean on God and follow wherever he leads? Am I willing to not just want to do his will, but am I willing to follow his ways? The third question we have to ask ourselves is, am I willing to do what God asks? Ephesians 2.10 says that we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which he prepared in advance for us to do. We are God's workmanship. Are we willing to do the work of God? Do I want God's will? Do I want God's ways? And what, do I want to do what God has designed me to do? We have to ask ourselves, do I want God's purpose in my life? 
And the kind of boldness that God blesses is a boldness when we desire to feel God's purpose above all other things. We see it in Acts chapter 4, verse 29. Acts 4, 29, they gather together. They know what's going on around them. In verse 29, it says, And now, O Lord, hear their threats. Now, right there, that prayer could have taken all kinds of turns. But he says, Hear their threats, but give us. Give us, your servants, great boldness in preaching your word. Not great boldness for some kind of self-security. No, great boldness in preaching your word. Not great boldness for protection. No, the, the, the primary point here was that we want to fulfill your purpose in our life. Right here, right now. But here's the thing. Whenever we desire God's purposes in our life, Whenever we want God's will, God's ways, and God's works to be lived out in and through us, that's when God invites us to come in. He invites us to come in and ask for anything that we need. He loves to bless this kind of boldness. So we come to God and we sing or we pray what they sung in the temple in 1 Chronicles 16. They said, search for the Lord and for his strength, seek him continually. They would sing that in the temple. We need God's strength. It's God's strength, not ours. We go to God and we ask for protection. What James was writing to the persecuted church when he wrote the letter of James, they were being scattered and they were being persecuted. And he just says this very matter of fact statement. I love it. He says, are any of you suffering hardship? You should pray. Notice he doesn't elaborate on it or anything. He just says, no, no, if you're suffering hardship, pray. You can either pray or you can panic. But the church knew what that meant. Whenever you're suffering hardship, we hit our knees and pray and we know that God will honor that request. Whenever we want God's purposes in our life, that's when we can lean on God's promises in our life. You know, whenever I learned this, it changed the way I lived. It absolutely changed the way I lived life and lived out my Christian faith. It's 2 Peter 1, 3 through 5. It says, by his divine power, God has given us everything we need for living a godly life. Everything we need, we already have. We have received all of this. How? By coming to know him. That's the learning part. The one who called us to himself by means of his marvelous glory and excellence. And because of his glory and excellence, he has given us great and precious promises. These are promises that enable you. Notice that. They enable us to do something. That enable you to share his divine nature. That's holiness. And escape the world's corruption caused by human desires. It's sanctification. In view of all this, make every effort to respond to God's promises. James is, I mean, Peter is saying we have to keep the promises prominent in our mind. We have to hang on to them. We have to cling to them. Whenever we want God's purposes, he says, I give you promises that I will be there for you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. I will be with you every step of the way. And while we're living out God's purposes now, one of the things we have to do to endure that hardship as we are moving forward is we have to look at God's past. We have to remember what God has done in the past. It's a great theme of my own life. In Psalm 68, verse 28, he, uh, the psalmist said, Summon your might, O God. Display your power, O God, as you have in the past. And what we see here from the early church is that we are bold. We can have boldness when we're spending time with God and when our desire is to fulfill his purposes, his will, his ways, his works in our life. And whenever we want that, we can go to him and he gives us everything we need. And that's the kind of boldness that he blesses. But point number three is this. And it's so important. And that is that I am bold when God shows up. I am bold when God shows up. There's boldness that God can instill in you, and then there's boldness that God gives you in the moment when he shows up and manifests his presence in powerful ways. We saw the early church here in Acts 4.29 ask for boldness in preaching the word. Acts 4.31, it says, after this, the meeting place shook, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit, and then they preached the word of God, with boldness. That's called prayer answered. The truth is we can have, there's a shift going on in the world at this point in history, in the early parts of Acts. There's a shift taking place. 
And the shift was between what was a religious view of life and a regenerational view of life. See, the religious view of life says that I have some contractual agreement with God, and if I don't do some things, and if I do do some things, then, then God, would one day will you let me in? The, the regenerational view, the doctrine of regeneration is so important. It's where God brings us from death to life. I touched on this last week. But what happens in that view is that the Holy Spirit changes why you live, how you live, and most importantly, who you live for. And that's what we see at play in the early church. That all of a sudden, the shift is taking place. And now God is showing up, like on the day of Pentecost, like in the prayer meeting uh, in the temple in Acts chapter 3, like in this prayer meeting in Acts chapter 4, God is showing up in a whole new way by the power of the Holy Spirit that now lives in them, not just around them or upon them. Huge shift, in, not only in church history, but in human history. And that's what would lead Paul to write the words in 2 Corinthians chapter 3. He says, the old way, with laws etched on stone. Notice that. It's an external thing. It's stagnant. Etched on stone. It led to death. Though it began with such glory that the people of Israel could not bear to look at Moses' face when he's coming down off the mountains with the tablets. For his face shone with the glory of God, even though the brightness was already fading. Shouldn't we, have expect, shouldn't we expect far greater glory under the new way now that the Holy Spirit is giving life? See, the Holy Spirit has done something new now in the book of Acts. If the old way, which brings condemnation, was glorious, how much more glorious is the new way, which makes you right with God? The old way couldn't make you right with God. Now the power of the Holy Spirit in your life can make you right with God. In fact, the first glory was not glorious at all compared with the overwhelming glory of the new way. So if the old way, which has been replaced, was glorious, how much more glorious is the new way, which remains forever, it's eternal. Since this new way gives us such confidence, we can be very what? Bold. That's where the boldness comes from. When God shows up in your life in a powerful way, you can be bold in fear. You can be bold in anxiety. You can be bold in the, in the face of criticism. You can be bold when people belittle you. You can be bold when people mock you. You can be bold when people threaten you. They did all of that to Peter and John, and the boldness remained. Because they were, and they were bold because they spent time with God. They were approaching God. They wanted to fulfill his purposes, and God was showing up in their life. And the truth is, is that we're either going to build our lives with eternity in mind and the Holy Spirit present in our lives, or we're going to be tossed to and fro by fear. And that's my concluding question for you. Who are you afraid of? What are you fearing right now? I think in the providence of God, I had a man come all the way to, from Kenya to remind me that the godly are as bold as lions. May we be found godly. Amen? Amen. Father, we love you. And we thank you because you have placed your spirit within us. And only by the power of the Holy Spirit can we have the boldness that you desire we have. And so, Lord, in this moment, would you break whatever needs to be broken that we may be whole in you? I pray this in Jesus' good and powerful name. And everybody said.
standing. Let's just close in prayer. Father, thank you. Father, thank you. Father, I thank you that you are the God, the only one who can break the chains that hold us back. And so, Lord, I pray for each and every one of us today that we would not leave this place still carrying those chains. And Lord, maybe we need to find someone this morning to talk to before we drive off the campus. Maybe we need uh, to go over to the stained glass windows for prayer ministry, whatever it is. But I pray we would not leave until we surrender to you. For anyone who is here in the room watching online who does not know you, I pray they would just surrender their life to you. Maybe for the first time or maybe again. And today as we leave this place, I thank you that when we see dry bones, you do see an army. So Lord, would you raise us up that we may be the men and women that you have called us to be. Let us not walk in fear for what can man do to me. May our eyes be set on you and you alone as we seek to fulfill your purposes in our lives. Let it be so today. Let it be so this week. Let it be so in the years and decades ahead. Lord Jesus, we love you, and we thank you for loving us. I pray this in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and everybody said.